see. Is the microphone working? Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, so, so thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for that inc unbelievably kind introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, uh, give the Strachey Lecture and uh, to be here at Oxford, you know, among uh, so many uh, uh, old friends and colleagues and also, you know, at a place that uh, played such a pivotal role in the birth of quantum computing. Uh, so uh, when I uh, did a Google image search for quantum computer, uh, this is one of the first things that came up. Uh, so I'm not really sure whether that's what they look like. I mean, it <laughs> may, may become apparent in this talk that I am uh, a theorist rather than an engineer. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the most interesting things and what I want to tell you about today is that uh, despite being about as far as you can possibly get on the theoretical end of uh, quantum computing, uh, even I am actually talking to the engineers and the experimentalists, and I will uh, tell you something about, about why. Uh, so, um, so the title of the talk is uh, Quantum Supremacy. So I should you know, uh, admit at the outset that uh, it's a little bit of an unfortunate term. Uh, it's a term that's uh, uh, come into uh, use you know, uh, a few years ago. I think it was John Preskill who first started using it. Uh, but um, um, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, so, 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 I, so I come from uh, the US. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, how many of you uh, here follow the news, but uh, in the US there's a uh, presidential candidate by the name of Trump. And uh, he, uh, uh, so because of uh, uh, his candidacy, people have actually asked me about uh, whether I will uh, formally disavow quantum supremacy and quantum supremacists. <laughs> uh, um, you know, now when, when, uh, when Mr. Trump was asked the uh, question, you know, whether he would disavow uh, a white supremacy, you probably all know his, his, his reply was that uh, he needed to research it further. Uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to quantum supremacy, uh, I too uh, need to research this further. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, but in this talk, I'll tell you about the research that I have done uh, and, and, uh, the, and that my colleagues have done uh, on this topic. So, so, what, so what exactly do we mean, by, or do, do people mean by this term uh, quantum uh, supremacy? Uh, so, uh, so it's a term that's basically uh, is used to uh, refer to a, um, uh, a certain uh, 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 task that people uh, uh, are, I would say, racing to achieve right now, uh, uh, which, which is to, um, um, to uh, do some uh, uh, experiment in quantum computation, you know, hopefully with uh, hardware that will uh, uh, be available in the, in the near future say, you know, five years or uh, 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 maybe even less than that, uh, which will, uh, you know, not uh, uh, break any cryptography, uh, will not, you know, factor fa uh, an enormous number, uh, uh, will not do, do anything of any practical use to anyone. Uh, that's still uh, a ways off. Uh, but it will do something that, while useless, uh, is nevertheless hard. Okay, uh, something that we can have some sort of confidence or reason to believe is ha would be hard to simulate using a classical computer for, for some meaning of the word hard. Okay, uh, you know, it would take manifestly more time to get the same sort of result uh, using classical computation. Uh, this is a uh, milestone that uh, you know, despite uh, 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 sort of being claimed, you know, every week or so in the popular press, uh, I would say has not yet been achieved. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if we do a, a fair comparison, that is, if we compare uh, quantum computation, you know, not against uh, uh, just, you know, a, a, a poor classical algorithm, but against the very best classical algorithms that could be, desi that could be devised for the same sorts of tasks. Okay, but, um, but uh, it is plausible uh, for reasons I'll go into that uh, within a few years we will have the capability uh, to, uh, to do something uh, with quantum mechanical hardware, you know, which is a uh, well-defined mathematical task, uh, but uh, for which, you know, we could argue that uh, uh, um, uh, classical simulation would take a lot longer 
than, uh, than, 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 uh, than, than, than the quantum computation. Uh, I think that this will be a major milestone. Uh, this will sort of uh, 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 cast, uh, you could say, a severe doubt on uh, what we call the extended church Turing thesis, which has been sort of a foundational belief of uh, computer science uh, since the 1960s. And uh, for me personally, uh, you know, this uh, uh, um, um, overthrowing this extended church Turing thesis is really you know, the reason why I got into quantum computing uh, in the first place. Because you know, sometimes people ask, well, you know, what is the, the biggest <coughs> application of a, of a quantum computer, right? And you may have heard of some of them. You know, uh, is it uh, breaking all, all the cryptography that we use on the internet today? Uh, or is it uh, simulating quantum mechanics itself which, uh, uh, you know, uh, for designing drugs or designing new materials? which you might say is a more positive application for humanity than you know, breaking uh, 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 codes and reading people's email. Okay, or uh, you know, is it uh, optimization or machine learning? You know, those are certainly huge application areas, but for those it's less clear how much advantage a quantum computer would really give us, uh, uh, even, even if we had one. Um, uh, my, my answer to that has always been that you know, there is uh, one application of quantum computing which is more important to me than any of those. And that is uh, to disprove the people who say that it's impossible. Okay, uh, that's, that, 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 that's why I am in this. Uh, I think that uh, quantum computing is uh, in some sense the most stringent test of quantum mechanics itself that, you know, that we, uh, uh, maybe that, we'll, that we're going to see in our lifetimes. And uh, you know, if it is worth building the Large Hadron Collider or worth building LIGO, which you know are these uh, amazing, m wonderful machines that you know so far mostly you know sort of triumphantly confirm our existing theories, then surely it is worth it to see whether quantum mechanics you know still holds in this regime of computational intractability, and. Um, you know, and uh, I, uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, on my blog and elsewhere just arguing against quantum computing skeptics. And, you know, I would just, I would, I would just like to see them admit that they were wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, 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 I'll confess to that motive. You know, of course, you know, if they, if they turned out to be right, you know, in some sense that's, that's, the even, the, that's even a more exciting outcome to me because that, I, I think, would force a revision in our understanding of physics itself. If there's really some deep and fundamental reason why you cannot build a quantum computer, then that, you know, uh, we would have to rewrite the textbooks to explain why, right? Uh, uh, believing you can build a quantum computer is just the conservative option, okay? But, uh, um, um, you know, but uh, e e either way, I would like to know the truth. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so this is, you know, sort of what I've been advocating to the, you know, uh, experimentalists is uh, uh, sort of to, uh, you know, disentangle the, so to speak, the uh, question of, uh, uh, you know, what a quantum computer would be practically useful for from the question of just can we demonstrate to everyone's satisfaction that we can achieve, you know, a clear quantum speed up at all and just focus on doing the latter first, okay? And uh, uh, that just seems like the right order to me, okay? And, uh, and I am actually very, uh, uh, you know, a, a because of developments within the last five or six years, I'm very optimistic that this clear quantum speed up, you know, will be uh, uh, achievable, you know, relatively soon. But there's a lot more that has to happen uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, engineering and there is also more that has to happen in terms of theory, okay, in terms of understanding what is or isn't uh, hard to simulate using a classical computer and why. Okay, and so that, that's what I'll focus on more in this talk. Okay, so first of all, so what is this extended church touring thesis that I'm you know, so interested in trying to refute? Well, so the original church touring thesis uh, was a statement about computability, okay, and uh, uh, the way that I would uh, uh, interpret it is uh, as, as a statement that uh, e everything that is computable, you know, by, by any d device that you could physically build uh, is also computable by a Turing machine, which is, you know, this uh, mathematical idealization of what we mean by a computer. Um, 
you know, it's not clear that Church or Turing themselves uh, ever, you know, uh, 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 quite said that. But, uh, but it's, in any case, it's what they should have said. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 80 years, you know, after Church and Turing, you know, this, this thesis uh, remains on very solid ground as a, uh, um, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a statement about our laws of physics. Uh, you know, you know uh, there is um, uh, maybe, you know, uh, one person who, is, who has tried to, to uh, uh, fight it, uh, 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 Sir Roger Penrose, uh, who uh, I guess is uh, also here in, in, in Oxford. Uh, uh, but, you know, it is, uh, um, you know, almost a, you could say, a backhanded compliment to the church touring thesis sort of how hard uh, he has had to work to uh, develop any sort of alternative to it. Um, now, the, the extended church touring thesis uh, sticks its neck out further, and it talks about what is efficiently computable. Okay, it says that anything that we could uh, uh, efficiently uh, or feasibly compute by a, a physically buildable device, meaning, let's say, com you know, our, our rough and ready approximation in computer science be, you know, meaning, you know, anything we can compute in polynomial time, you know, using resources that scale uh, like the problem size to some fixed power, uh, ought to be computable in polynomial time using a Turing machine, meaning, you know, it should be in the complexity class P, okay, or at any rate, at least in the complexity class BPP which is the probabilistic version of P, okay? There should be a, you know, a deterministic or probabilistic uh, 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 Turing machine to, you know, efficiently simulate whatever we can do in the physical world. Okay, now, you know, just, just the very fact that I had to equivocate between deterministic or maybe probabilistic, you know, I think uh, 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 illustrates that, you know, that this thesis from the very beginning was on shakier ground than the computability one. Okay, but uh, 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 probably most of you know that in the 1990s, uh, this um, e uh, extended or polynomial time church Turing thesis uh, developed uh, really, really serious fissures. Um, so Peter Shore uh, came along, and uh, uh, those are supposed to be cracks in the foundations <laughs> of uh, the church Turing thesis. Some people say that they look like horns, but uh, I just, I'm just not good enough at PowerPoint. Okay, so, uh, so Peter Shore uh, developed or uh, discovered a polynomial time algorithm for factoring integers uh, using a quantum computer, okay, which is a problem certainly that no one has proven is, uh, is, is hard for a classical computer, but that we, you know, for better or worse, we believe that enough that we base the security of most of our electronic commerce on, 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 on the belief that that and related problems are hard. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, the way, uh, you know, let me, let me show you a different, um, or maybe more, more unusual way to state Shor's discovery. Okay, uh, you know, Shor's theorem is not merely about, you know, a hypothetical future in which quantum computers are built. It's a hardness result for a problem that could concern us right now, namely the problem of simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, this is a problem of enormous concern to chemists and physicists. It's what, you know, a significant percentage of supercomputing time is actually used for today. And Shor's theorem, in some sense, you know, explains why simulating quantum mechanics seems to be hard in terms of uh, more standard problems in computer science. It says that if you had an efficient algorithm for simulating nature, for simulating, you know, quantum physics, using a conventional computer, then you would also necessarily have a fast classical algorithm for factoring integers. Okay, why? Because a simulation would in particular have to be able to simulate a quantum computer running Shor's factoring <coughs> algorithm. Okay, so, um, so it was, you know, an amazing uh, connection between ideas that really sort of uh, started off this field. Uh, but now, you know, because this is a uh, computer science, uh, uh, lecture series, I thought, you know, at some point, uh, uh, for, for those of you who, uh, uh, you know, remain in, uh, 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 innocent of it, uh, I need to explain what quantum mechanics is. I don't have a lot of time to do that, but fortunately, I think I can do it in one slide, okay? So, uh, you know, I think that um, um, physicists, you know, uh, uh, really, you know, um, did a remarkable job of sort of uh, 
making quantum mechanics look, you know, really complicated and, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, hard to learn, which, you know, indeed it is if you really care about, uh, you know, making predictions about actual physical systems, okay? But I'm a computer scientist. I don't, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the marvelous secret in quantum information is that uh, 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 quantum mechanics turns out to be just remarkably uh, simple uh, once you take the physics out of it. And um, <laughs> the way that I, uh, you know, and many of us in this field think about quantum mechanics is that it's a certain generalization of the rules of probability themselves. Okay, so I think of it as sort of not even physics in the usual <coughs> sense. It's, just, it's more like an operating system that physical theories can, can run on as application software. Okay, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we all know that in probability theory, you would describe your knowledge of a physical system by uh, 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 using a list of non-negative real numbers, which uh, add up to one, and uh, which we call probabilities. Okay, and you know, which describe the likelihood that you'll find the system in one configuration or in another one if you, if you look at it. Um, but now in addition to looking at a system, uh, uh, one thing you can also do is uh, transform it somehow. Like if you have a coin that you flip, before looking at the coin, you know, you could just uh, 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 flip it. Uh, you know, and that would correspond to taking your vector of probabilities and acting on it by a linear transformation, which has to have the property that it maps any uh, normalized probability vector to another uh, probability vector. Okay, so any linear transformation that does that we call a stochastic uh, uh, transformation. Okay, uh, it's uh, given by you know, a non-negative matrix where all the columns sum to one. Okay, it, it's, a it's a matrix that preserves the one norm. Okay, now, uh, if, you know, without knowing anything about physics, you know, let's say you were a mathematician in the 1800s, okay, if someone had come to you and said, I want you to invent a theory which is just like this one, just like probability theory, except it should be based on the two norm rather than the one norm, because, you know, the two norm is the one that, you know, that sort of God prefers in every situation, okay, you would, you would be more or less forced to invent quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, you know, this is not the usual story of, of how, you know, where it comes from. You know, usually, you know, you tell a whole uh, uh, long tale about, uh, uh, um, you know, I guess a, a, a box that emits radiation and, uh, you know, some uh, hydrogen atoms and so forth. Right, that is the story of how these rules came to be discovered, which is, a, you know, an important and fascinating story that took place between 1900 and 1925 or so. But if you just want to know at the end of the day, what are the rules? Uh, they are um, like the rules of probability, except that instead of uh, uh, a vector of non-negative real numbers, now we describe the state of a system using a vector of complex numbers, okay, which we call amplitudes. Um, and uh, if you measure a, you know, uh, a system, then these amplitudes become probabilities, right? So, you know, it would, uh, you know, you don't want a theory to tell you you'll have a negative 10% chance of, you know, seeing some outcome, uh, let alone uh, an I percent chance, okay? But uh, so you uh, can, you know, each amplitude becomes a probability by taking its squared absolute value, okay? And uh, measurement, you may have heard, is a destructive process. So the system, you know, when you look at a system, you force it to collapse to one of the outcomes. You know, it makes up its mind, uh, you know, it, becomes outcome i with probability uh, um, um, absolute value of alpha sub i squared, and then, it, and then it sticks with that choice, okay? Now, in addition to looking at a system, you can also act on it, which now means taking this vector of amplitudes and acting on it using any linear transformation that preserves the two norm, okay? That we call a unitary matrix. Um, uh, it's just a complex generalization of an orthogonal matrix. Okay, and uh, so, so those are the two rules. You can make a measurement that gives this probabilistic result, or you can transform your state by a, a, a unitary matrix. Okay, and um, uh, all of the differences, you know, all of the uh, weirdnesses of the quantum world that you've ever heard about are just ultimately traceable 
to the fact that amplitudes uh, are based on the two norm and therefore you know, work differently than classical probabilities do, which are based on the one norm. Okay. Uh, so all right, so now I need one slide to tell you what is quantum computing. Uh, so, um, uh, so, this, so this idea dates back to the early 1980s when uh, um, 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 a few physicists like uh, Richard Feynman and uh, uh, of course David Deutsch, who's uh, here in Oxford, uh, uh, started you know, uh, uh, noticing that uh, if you want to simulate a quantum system using a, uh, a conventional computer, it's, it seems to require an exponential blow up in the amount of time. <laughs> uh, why? Because you know, the rules of quantum mechanics say that you need to assign an amplitude to every possible configuration that your system could be in. Okay? So if you had n bits, or you know, as, as we call them, uh, qubits, you know, quantum bits, uh, there are two to the n possible configurations of those uh, qubits. And uh, the rules say that every one of those two to the n possibilities gets an amplitude. Okay, so just to keep track of, say, a thousand particles, you know, nature off to the side somewhere needs to uh, maintain a vector of two to the thousand complex numbers. And whenever something is done to the particles, nature needs to take that vector of size two to the thousand and multiply it by a matrix. Okay, so uh, you know that just seems like an enormous amount of effort for nature to be going to, and you know, and it you know it raises the in retrospect obvious question, you know, why don't we you know take that lemon of you know how hard quantum mechanics is to simulate and turn it into lemonade, okay, of uh, you know build a computer that would itself uh, uh, exploit you know this uh, 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 these amplitudes that could be, as, as we say, in a superposition of all of these states. Okay, so now, of course, the question arises, supposing we built such a computer, what would it be good for? Uh, Feynman and Deutsch were only able to give one real answer to that question, which is that uh, it, it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, you know, I think that that, that remains maybe po possibly the biggest, you know, real practical application uh, that a quantum computer uh, uh, would be known to have. Okay. Uh, but um, one uh, important point that I should clear up is that uh, you know, in like almost every popular article that's been written about this subject for the past uh, 25 years, uh, you know, it has uh, described a quantum computer as a device that would just try each possible answer in a different parallel universe, okay, or you know, in a in a in a different branch. Okay, that is uh, uh, that 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 is not how it works. Okay, uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, I don't care whether you believe or don't believe in you know, the reality of parallel universes. Okay, it's, you know, that's just, uh, that, that description that you constantly see of a quantum computer is wrong for just a straightforward technical reason. Okay, it's wrong because you c while you can create a superposition over all the possible answers to some problem, say giving each possible answer some amplitude, if you, you know, at some point you have to measure the computer to see what state it's in. And if you just make a measurement, not having done anything else, all you're going to see is a random answer. Okay? And if you just wanted a random answer, I mean, you could have picked one yourself with a lot less trouble. <laughs> uh, so you know, the only hope of getting a speed advantage from a quantum computer is to exploit uh, the ways that amplitudes are different from conventional probabilities. Okay? And in particular, the fact that amplitudes can also be negative, okay, or 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 or, or complex or whatever, uh, and so um, uh, you, the goal in quantum computing is always to choreograph things so that uh, the the amplitude, uh, the final amplitude for the correct answer is very very large, say close to one, whereas the final amplitudes for the incorrect answers are very small, close to zero. Okay, if you can arrange that, then when you measure the computer, you should see the right answer with a high probability. You know, and if it's mere, a computer that is merely correct 70% of the time, I should say, is perfectly fine for our purposes. Because you know, if you're not happy with a 70% chance of correctness, then just rerun the computer 100 times and take the majority answer. Okay, so, uh, uh, but, but now, um, how do you boost the probability of the right answer? Uh, the, uh, uh, what that uh, uh, always involves is sort of choreographing a pattern of quantum interference. 
So the idea is that for each wrong answer, there will be sort of some contributions to its amplitude that are positive and others that are negative. So on the whole, they will cancel each other out. Okay, whereas the, amp the, amp the contributions to the amplitude of the correct answer should all be in phase with each other, say all positive or all negative. If you can arrange that, then, you know, then that's, that, that is how you get a quantum speed up. Okay? It was not obvious to anyone that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that this very strange hammer will actually hit any of the nails that we care about in computer science, you know, besides simulating quantum mechanics itself. Okay, but, you know, being computer scientists, we can associate any concept with a, an inscrutable sequence of capital letters. <laughs> so uh, this is what was done by uh, my advisor, Umesh Fazarani, and his student, Ethan Bernstein, in 1993, when they defined the class BQP, or bounded error quantum polynomial time. This is the quantum generalization of the class P, you know, of uh, problems efficiently solvable with a classical computer. Okay, and uh, this is just all the problems that are solvable efficiently by a quantum computer with a bounded probability of error. Okay, and um, uh, so, so now Shor's <laughs> great discovery in the 90s could be phrased as saying that the factoring problem, strictly speaking, a decision version of the factoring problem, is in this uh, complexity class, BQP. Okay, and that, this was the discovery of course, it made many people interested in quantum computing who, who had not been before, like the intelligence agencies. Okay, uh, so just to show you, you know, a, a little map of the world to orient you a bit. So, you know, here is P, problems efficiently solvable with a classical computer. Here's NP, the problems whose answers are efficiently checkable by a classical computer. You know, at the top of NP are the famous NP complete problems. Okay, and you know, already here there are profound questions like the P versus NP question that you know you may have heard of. Um, uh, so now uh, BQP uh, is a uh, generalization of P. So you know, a quantum computer can always simulate a classical one, but it might be able to do more. Okay, and so sh what Shor showed is that BQP contains at least one um, NP problem, namely factoring which is not uh, uh, um, um, known to be in P, okay? So, um, you know, I, I drew BQP with a wavy border because everything quantum is spooky and mysterious, <laughs> okay? But, uh, you know, but we do know a little bit about this class now. Uh, so uh, we, um, so, you know, uh, uh, you know in, in particular you'll notice, you know, a factoring, as you may know, is neither known nor believed to be NP complete. There are excellent theoretical reasons why it should not be an NP-complete problem. Uh, and uh, to this day, you know, we do not know whether BQP contains NP. Okay, we don't know if there's an efficient quantum algorithm to solve the NP-complete problems. Many of us would conjecture that the answer is no, that you know, quantum computers will give you at most a limited advantage for that. Certainly, Shor's algorithm takes advantage of very, very special structure in the factoring problem. You know, ironically, some of the same structure that makes factoring so useful for public key cryptography. Okay. Um, now, in the other direction, we also don't know whether uh, BQP is contained in NP. So a quantum computer might be able to solve problems for which a classical computer cannot even efficiently verify the answer. Okay. Uh, that will be important later in the talk. Uh, now, we do know that, that BQP is contained in, uh, well, in polynomial space, in particular in a class called P to the sharp P, which means, uh, or my, as my students today call it, hashtag P, okay? <laughs> which means, um, you know, all, all the problems that you could solve if you had an oracle for counting problems, for, you know, counting the number of solutions to some uh, combinatorial problem. Uh, so, uh, so, so in particular, that means quantum computers will at most get an exponential advantage over classical ones, right? They will not do anything that is classically uncomputable, like the halting problem, okay? Uh, um, it also means that in our present state of knowledge, we really have no hope of proving unconditionally that quantum computers are more powerful than classical ones. Or in other words, that BQP is different from P. Okay, and that's a very important point. 
Okay, but the reasons for it have, in some sense, nothing to do with quantum computing. Okay, they're just, we, we don't even know how to separate P from P space, for example, right? And if those two were equal, then certainly, you know, uh, uh, P and BQP would get, you know, would get sandwiched together too. Okay, so any evidence that we're going to offer, say in this talk, that a quantum computer is achieving supremacy is going to have to be conditional on some hypothesis, on some kind of complexity theoretic hardness conjecture. And the question that will interest us is, is which conjecture? You know, how uh, safe and believable a conjecture can we make it? Okay, so, um, now you might say, well, you know, sounds like quantum computers just refute this extended charge Turing thesis. What more, you know, proof could, could anyone want, you know, than, than, than that they do factoring? Okay, there are two drawbacks, as I see it, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Shor's algorithm as, you know, evidence for quantum supremacy. Okay, the first is just the obvious one that, you know, as you may have heard, uh, building a, uh, actually building a quantum computer which is scalable which say could factor thousand digit numbers, turns out to be rather hard. Okay, uh, the world record, you know, after about, you know, m well over a billion dollars, I guess, of investment in this field, uh, and, you know, over 20 years of brilliant experimental effort has been that uh, uh, there is now, uh, there are now quantum computers that can factor uh, 21 into three times seven uh, with high statistical confidence. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think 35 may be on the horizon, okay? But, you know, you, uh, you know the, the, uh, uh, there's a huge problem called decoherence, which means sort of the unwanted interaction between the quantum computer and its external environment, which, you know, in effect prematurely measures the computer, okay? And if you want to build a scalable quantum computer, you need to get this decoherence down, <coughs> if not quite to zero, then to a very, very low uh, rate. And, um, so, you know, the experimentalists have made enormous progress toward that goal, uh, but they're not there yet. Uh, but, you know, you might ask, well, you know, couldn't we just take systems that they already have, that they're, you know, in the lab, right? You know, I mean, I mean there are lots of molecules where, you know, for which the Schrodinger equation seems kind of, you know, hard to solve. Right, but you know, unfortunately in those cases, you know, we don't know whether the hardness is, you know, is actually asymptotic or, you know, in nature, the kind that a theoretical computer scientist can analyze, or whether it's merely that, you know, someone, um, you know, will, will write down the ground state of this particular physical system and win the Nobel Prize for it, but that Nobel Prize will be maybe only O of one effort. You know, uh, uh, you know, maybe it won't be an exponentially scaling amount of effort. Okay, so, so, so now you might ask, can't we at least meet the experimentalist halfway? So I like to put it. That is, can't we say, look, you know, you don't have to build a full quantum computer that will factor numbers with Shor's algorithm, but just do, you know, something, you know, um, closer to what you can do today. Uh, that you know, that 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 we as computer scientists can then interpret as solving a, a problem that, that, that we understand, that we can argue about the hardness of, right? And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and if we forget about, you know, the problem having any practical importance, then that may dramatically expand, you know, the uh, number of places we could look for that. Uh, now, you know, the, the other issue is, of course, you know, factoring uh, might, for all we know, have a fast classical uh, algorithm. Uh, you know, I mean, um, um, you know, if a fast uh, factoring algorithm were discovered, the way I like to put it is that might collapse uh, the world's, you know, digital economy, but uh, it's not, no, it would not be known to collapse the polynomial hierarchy or uh, any, anything like that. Okay, so, you know, fa factoring from a theoretical standpoint is just this one particular problem, right, <laughs> that, you know, if it had a fast uh, uh, classical algorithm, it's not known to have any sort of wider consequences for other things. So, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could prove, for example, that, uh, you know, if you could efficiently simulate a quantum computer classically, so like if P were equal to BQP, then P would also be equal to NP, okay? That would be a wonderful result, okay? Now, we don't know how to show that, uh, I should say, uh, but, you know, in this talk, I'll show you how we can now come closer to that uh, than, than one might have thought possible, okay? So, you know, I think that uh, in this quest for quantum supremacy, 
you know, physicists are uh, really going to have to think more like uh, uh, applied cryptographers have been thinking for a long time, uh, which means, you know, you define a clear mathematical task that you can perform with the quantum hardware, hopefully of the near future. You think hard about how your worst enemy would perform that task or appear to perform it uh, using only classical resources. You know, a, uh, an excellent uh, a historical analog in physics for this is the violation of the Bell inequality, right? Which only just a year ago, you know, people managed to violate it in a way that closes off essentially all the loopholes as to how, you know, nature could have been uh, doing this in a way that was secretly classical behind the scenes. Okay, so we want to do a computation where, you know, we can then convince a skeptic that, you know, that this computation was not done in a way that you understand, in a way that was, you know, secretly, that, 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 that you can, you know, sleep easy at night uh, interpreting as, you know, just maybe it's just classical behind the scenes. Okay, uh, so, you know, so that means that, you know, uh, well, for one thing, you know, you should publish benchmark challenges. You should say, here is what I did, and, uh, you know, here is a benchmark. We challenge classical skeptics to do the same thing with their classical computer in any comparable amount of time. Uh, you should also be able to isolate a very, very clear uh, assumption, okay, that, that says, look, you know, if you could simulate my complicated system efficiently with a classical computer, then you would have to be solving this easy to state problem. Okay, so then people have a clear target to aim at, right? That if you believe that this clear problem is hard, then my quantum system is hard to simulate. Okay, so the same kind of game of reductions that people play in cryptography. Um, you know, and you should leave a safety margin. So I'm not interested in, you know, doing something like a factor of two faster than, you know, we could do it with, a, a, you know, a reasonable multi-core uh, classical computer. You know, I would like a factor of a billion faster, a factor of a trillion, okay? So, uh, so when, when these are your goals, uh, one of the things that we discovered within the last, you know, uh, uh, six or seven years is that you find yourself driven to consider what are called sampling problems, okay, which are broader than the problems that we usually think about in uh, theoretical computer science, which are just uh, decision problems, you know, with a yes or no answer. Okay, so a, a, in a sampling problem, you're given an input, say X, and your task is to output a sample, you know, either exactly or, or better yet, just approximately from a probability distribution, say D sub X, you know, over uh, uh, strings, okay, say over n bit strings, okay? And so, um, uh, so, so there, you know, these are problems that don't have a single valid output, you know, their goal is to sample, okay? These are also, you know, you know I mean, many c computer scientists have studied these problems as well. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you want to sample for a random point in a convex body, you want to sample a random matching in a graph, these would be examples of sampling problems, okay? And uh, so what we found is that, uh, you know, sampling problems can be, number one, um, much easier to solve with devices that fall short of universal quantum computers, okay, you know, and which might be available with technology of the near future. Number two, sampling problems uh, can be much, much easier somehow to argue are hard for a classical computer uh, uh, to solve. Um, you know, but uh, the sampling problems that we'll talk about, you know, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't have practical applications that I know of, uh, nor is it very easy to verify the result with a classical computer. So you do give something up. Okay, nothing's free. Okay, so a, 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 uh, an example of these sampling problems uh, that we've sort of uh, uh, learned to focus on in quantum supremacy research is uh, what's called boson sampling. So this is something that my student, Alex Arkhipov, and I proposed in 2011. And uh, it's basically, it's a very rudimentary type of quantum computing, which involves only uh, uh, identical non-interacting photons. Okay, so the um, classical analog of our system is uh, co something called Galton's board, which you can see in many science museums. It's where you uh, drop a balls one by one into a lattice of pegs, 
and the balls sort of bounce around randomly. And then you see that uh, th uh, the, the bins they land in at the bottom approximates a binomial distribution. Right? So this is not a universal computer. But you know, if you didn't know any other way to calculate binomial coefficients, you could use this thing to estimate them. You know, it'd be not, you know, maybe not entirely useless. Okay, so what is the quantum analog of Galton's board? Well, we could replace the uh, uh, pegs by beam splitters. Uh, we could replace the balls by photons. Okay, and then, you know, physicists have known even, you know, since the 80s that, you know, that, that you already, with just two photons and one beam splitter, get some very interesting phenomena. So this is, so here's an effect called the hong o mandel dip. Okay, it says you shoot two identical photons at the exact same time down the two arms of a 50-50 beam splitter. Okay, and the photons never directly interact with each other, right? I mean, they have, in, a, in the sense that there's no force acting between them. You know, certainly not at, at low energies. Okay, um, so, um, and nevertheless, what, what you find if you do this experiment perfectly, say, is that 50% of the time, the two photons both end up in this arm. 50% of the time, they both end up in that arm. Okay, and, and they never end up in separate arms. Okay, uh, uh, so somehow they become perfectly correlated, even though they have never interacted. Okay, so, so you know, what on earth is going on? Okay, so, you know, just like with everything else in quantum mechanics, there is an answer. You know, it's not just mysterious, confusing, whatever. There is an answer, and the answer involves the amplitudes having minus signs. Okay, uh, so basically, what 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 happens is that in uh, when you write down the quantum state of the system, there are two <coughs> possible, there you know, and you write the amplitude for the two photons to go down separate arms. There are two different contributions to that amplitude. One that comes from the photons going like this and the other that comes from the photons going like that and crossing each other. And one of the contributions is positive and the other one is negative. So they cancel each other out and you never see them going down separate arms. Okay, the amplitudes where they go down the same arm reinforce. Okay, so the basic idea is that if you have n photons, then you actually, to find the amplitude for them to end up in some given configuration, you have to sum over sort of all n factorial possible ways that these photons could be rearranged, since they're identical particles, uh, bosons, namely, right? And uh, uh, swapping two of them does nothing to the state of the world. Okay, so you have to add, so just to find the amplitude for one configuration, you have to add up n factorial complex numbers. And if these are pointing in different directions in the complex plane, then those contributions could cancel each other out. Okay, so the formal setup is that you know you have a network of uh, beam splitters, let's say with uh, n uh, input modes, some larger number m of output modes. Uh, say n identical photons enter, one per input mode. Uh, we assume for simplicity, let's say that they all leave in different modes. They don't have to, but if the number of modes is large enough, then with high probability they will. Okay, in which case. There are m choose n possible you know, configurations of the output. Now, to find the probability of one of those output configurations, well, what you need to do is, uh, so uh, you look at the network of beam splitters and you look at the uh, uh, sort of uh, section of a unitary matrix that that defines. So it would be an m by n matrix whose columns are all orthogonal unit vectors. And then the probability of a particular outcome is just going to be given by the squared absolute value of the permanent of the appropriate n by n submatrix of that m by n matrix. Okay, so uh, uh, now what is the permanent of a matrix? Well, if you know what the determinant is, the permanent is the same thing but without the minus signs. Okay, so it is uh, this. It's an extremely important function in theoretical computer science and combinatorics which so happens to also play an important role in physics, namely in you know, uh, 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 giving you the amplitudes for uh, identical bosons. Okay, and uh, so the uh, permanent of an n by n matrix is just the sum <laughs> over all n factorial permutations of you know, the product of the entries along that permutation. Okay, 
And uh, so, so, the, so, so, ampli so, so the amplitudes for uh, um, <coughs> identical bosons are permanents. By the way, the amplitudes for identical fermions are determinants. Okay, so uh, you know these these two functions that uh, play such a you know wonderful role in computer science are also you know uh, 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 show up in nature. And um, so then the probability is just the absolute square of the amplitude. Okay, and uh, so so uh, uh, you know this was noticed in the 1990s, I think by. Uh, Troyansky and Tishby, people realize that this is an amazing connection because the permanent is very, very well known to computer scientists as a hard function. Okay, in fact, the permanent uh, a valiant proved in the 1970s that it is complete for that class sharp P that I mentioned earlier, the class of all uh, counting problems, okay, which is even above the NP complete problems. Okay, so, uh, um, so this you know, immediately raises a question. Right, if uh, uh, you know, photon amplitudes are given by permanence of matrices, then could you just use a system of identical photons to calculate the permanent of any matrix of your choice? Right, you know, that, and that thereby solve you know, an NP complete problems and even, even more than that in polynomial time. Okay, so this seems you know, uh, too good to be true. Right? You ought to be you know, suspicious <laughs> of, of any such thing. Okay, and in this case, you know, the answer turns out to be no. Okay? Uh, this, this does not let you calculate the permanent of a matrix of your choice. The reason why not is interesting. Okay? It is because, uh, once again, it's, you know, amplitudes in quantum mechanics are not directly observable. At some point, you've got to measure this uh, system. When you measure it, you're just going to see uh, uh, a single you know, uh, 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 configuration of the photons with probability given by the absolute square of the permanent of an associated matrix. Right? So you don't directly observe permanents. Okay, now it's true that if you repeated this experiment enough times, you could use this to estimate the squared permanent of a matrix of your choice. But in general, you know, to embed your matrix as a sub-matrix of a unitary matrix, you need to make it so that its permanent is exponentially small, which means that if you wanted a decent estimate for the permanent, then you would need to repeat this experiment an exponential number of times, which means that in the end, you're getting no advantage over uh, what you'd get if you just used you know, a classical computer with, a, with, with, with brute force. Okay, so then, you know, so then this raises the que question, well then, then why is boson sampling interesting? if it doesn't let you calculate the permanent. Okay, so what Arkhipov and I did was that we looked at what boson sampling does do, which is that, well, it samples a random matrix, uh, if you like, in such a way that matrices with large permanents are somewhat more likely to be sampled than matrices with small permanents. Okay, now what is such an ability good for? Well, I have no idea. Okay, but we can give evidence that even that sampling task is already classically hard. Okay, so um, so the first sort of theorem that that we observe is that you know if there were say a polynomial time classical algorithm that could sample from exactly the same distribution as the system of of, of, of bosons would sample from in the ideal case, then this would have a, a, a striking consequence for complexity theory. Uh, it would mean that the p to the sharp p would equal bpp to the np, uh, which uh, if you don't know what that means, uh, uh, you could take my word for it that it's bad. Uh, <laughs> it, would, uh, it would mean that you know, two complexity classes would, you know, that are both very powerful would be equal to each other, and that's a problem because one of them is supposed to be way more powerful even than the other one. Okay, uh, uh, so p to the sharp p contains the entire polynomial hierarchy, whereas uh, bpp to the np is contained within the polynomial hierarchy, right? If those two became equal, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse to the third level, okay? Which is, uh, you could say, is in some sense almost as bad as p equaling np, but sort of just sort of at a higher level up, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, the reason why this would happen Basically, that, that if you had a fast classical sampling algorithm uh, for, for uh, uh, boson sampling, 
then uh, you, know, you could take a permanent, which is a sum of both positive and negative terms, uh, you know, and you could represent it as a sum only of, of, of non-negative terms, okay? Because you could represent it as the probability that this classical algorithm will produce this output, let's say, right? Which is then, you know, just, you're just ca counting how many different randomness, uh, uh, different sequences of random bits could this classical algorithm be fed that would cause it to produce this particular <laughs> outcome as its output, right? Now that might still be an exponentially hard problem, but unlike the, you know, directly simulating the quantum system, that is just a problem of summing a whole bunch of non-negative terms, okay? And that is the sort of thing that we know how to do in a complexity class like BPP with an oracle for NP, you know, so randomized polynomial time with an oracle for NP complete problems, which again is, is unrealistically powerful, but less so than uh, polynomial time with an oracle for counting problems, okay? If these two are equal, then I think, you know, something way, way uh, uh, more <coughs> perverse happens than there being a fast classical factoring algorithm, okay? Which is that the polynomial hierarchy collapses, okay? Um, now, what we really want to do is say that even a classical algorithm that um, um, approximately sampled, you know, that approximately simulated a bosonic experiment uh, would have unlikely complexity consequences. Uh, th that's a much more complicated problem. Uh, we conjecture that, the, 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 that this would already imply a collapse of a polynomial hierarchy, uh, but, but, we're, but we're not able to prove that. Okay, the result that we can prove says that if there were an efficient classical algorithm to sample a probability distribution, which is even anywhere close, let's say in its total variation distance, to the, uh, perm to the distribution involving permanence that this you know, uh, uh, bosonic system is, is supposed to sample from, then that would have the following consequence for complexity theory. Okay, it would mean that there is an algorithm in this complexity class BPP with NP oracle, which would estimate the permanent of, uh, or the, the permanent squared, let's say, of a matrix of uh, independent Gaussian entries with high probability over, over such matrices. Okay, now we suspect that that task is already sharp P complete, which, you know, if so, we would get to have the consequence that even a noisy simulation of our experiment, or you could say even a simulation of a physically realistic version of this experiment would already collapse the polynomial hierarchy, okay? This remains an outstanding open problem. So, you know, it's just a problem about classical complexity theory, but which is, you know, inspired by this optics experiment. Okay, so now an obvious difficulty with boson sampling is, you know, supposing that you do such an experiment how does a classical computer even verify the result? Um, so, you know, one way to, the obvious way to do it, if you like, is just to calculate the permanence of uh, 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 all the submatrices corresponding to the outcomes that are observed. And then check whether these permanents are, as it were, anomalously large, you know, consistent with your doing boson sampling. Okay, this, this works. This is just fine, but you might complain, well wait, doesn't that entail calculating permanence? And wasn't the whole point of everything you're doing that the permanent is exponentially hard? Well, uh, doesn't that defeat the purpose? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know if maybe so, if you had you know, 100 photons or 1,000 photons. But our claim is that there is a sweet spot for quantum supremacy experiments. The sweet spot would be, you know, at w when you're dealing with about 30 or 40 photons, okay? In which case, we'd be dealing with the permanence of 30 by 30 or 40 by 40 matrices. Okay, such permanents are difficult to calculate with a classical computer, but they're not impossible to calculate, okay? With enough effort, you could calculate, you know, the permanence with a classical computer in order to verify that the experiment was working as intended but you could see that, that doing the result classically was taking you much more effort. It was a lot harder, okay? And so this is really the sort of the sweet spot that we're hoping to aim for. Now, what is the current experimental situation with boson sampling? 
Uh, well, um, last summer, uh, a year ago, uh, the group uh, at, uh, I guess, uh, down the road at Bristol uh, reported uh, uh, boson sampling experiments with uh, six photons you know, beating three or four photons that had been done previously. Uh, and so uh, basically, you know, they, uh, they, they, you know, it was an incredibly hard experiment. I think they only managed to, to see 15 events or so. Okay, but they, uh, uh, but they, you know, to within uh, experimental limits, they confirmed that the amplitudes for processes involving six photons are indeed given by the permanence of six by six matrices of complex numbers you know, as quantum mechanics said all along that they would be, okay? But now uh, uh, we have direct confirmation of it, okay? Um, now scaling up to a larger number of photons, like 30 or 40, presents a very hard engineering problem. And the basic reason for that is that you need all the photons to arrive at the uh, detectors at the same time if you want to see, you know, this interference pattern where all n factorial possibilities contribute to your amplitude, okay? And um, right now, we just, there do not exist on Earth photon sources that are good enough for this purpose, okay? Uh, there are sources that, you know, sometimes will emit a photon, but you can't control exactly when. And so then, you know, if you have n of these, you know, imagine how long it takes until they all happen to emit a photon at exactly the same time. Well, you know, the time you have to wait uh, grows exponentially with n. Okay, uh, so that, that, that's really the problem here. Okay, there is uh, uh, an amazing idea that could help with this, which uh, on my blog I named Scattershot BS, Scattershot <laughs> Boson Sampling, okay? It was, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea. It was proposed uh, right here in, in Oxford by uh, in the Ian Walmsley's group, uh, Steve Kultamer, uh, so, uh, uh, one who, who uh, explained it to me. And, uh, you know, and, and the idea here is that you can have a whole bunch of photon sources which are not deterministic, which will, you know, emit a photon whenever they feel like it, but they're, but they're heralded. So each one, when it does emit a photon, it also emits a partner photon going in the opposite direction that tells you that, yeah, a photon was flying out this way, right, at this time. And then, you know, let's say you have a thousand of these sources, and let's say that it, within a given time window, only 10 of them happen to generate a photon. Okay, well then, at least we know which 10 they are. And whichever 10 they are, we just define those after the fact to be our initial state for our boson sampling task. Okay, and since we didn't care anyway about exactly what distribution we were sampling, as long as it was some distribution that's classically hard, we don't really care which sources happen to be the initial ones, right? We can let the experiment decide that for us. Okay, it's a beautiful idea. Uh, but all right, but given the difficulties in scaling this up, you know, it is worth considering, you know, whether boson sampling-like ideas could be ported to other quantum computing architectures, you know, where, uh, uh, where, where maybe progress will come sooner than it, than, than it will come in, in, in optics. So this is just, you know, and I just, can I just take like five minutes or so? Okay, so I just want to tell you a little bit about what, uh, what we've been working on recently. Uh, so, you know, in a few years, we are very likely to have um, 40 or 50 very high quality qubits with controllable couplings uh, in, you know, two possibly, you know, e either or both of, of two architectures, uh, superconducting qubits or trapped ions. Okay, uh, so there's been uh, amazing progress made along these lines. Uh, you know, the ones who are sort of most, I would say, laser focused on scaling up right now are the, uh, you know, possibly uh, uh, the, the group of John Martinez uh, at Google uh, now, uh, uh, formerly uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara. Okay, but there are other groups, you know, all over the world who are, work who are also working on uh, these two uh, uh, approaches. Um, and uh, I should say, by the way, that you, know, uh, uh, you may have heard there's this company, uh, D-Wave, it's called, which uh, you know, has, uh, you know, claim, you know, says that they have 1,000 qubits. Uh, but we don't, you know, we don't really know what to say about sort of the, the, the quality of those qubits. Or you know, are they good enough to do something which is hard to simulate with a classical computer, uh, you know, even in principle? Uh, you know, and so personally, I am sort of way more excited about 40 or 50 qubits that I, under, that I, that I understand 
than about a thousand qubits that I don't understand. Okay, and Martinez, is, you know, uh, <laughs> is aiming to get, you know, f within the next few years, sort of 40 or 50 qubits that seem like they would be good enough for a real quantum supremacy demonstration. And so that, that's sort of the exciting thing. But this is going to require thinking of sort of new ideas beyond boson sampling, right? We now have both the burden and the opportunity to sort of um, um, adapt you know, uh, our complexity theory to the hardware that's going to become available within the next few years. Okay, uh, so I think, you know, 40 or 50 qubits are still not going to be enough for quantum error correction, you know, or uh, uh, to any, you know, uh, substantial degree that would let you do factor any interestingly large number or anything like that. But it may very well be enough for a convincing quantum supremacy demonstration. Okay. Uh, so I would say that our duty as theoretical computer scientists is to tell the experimenters what they ought to be doing with their existing hardware or with, you know, the stuff that they're uh, planning to build within, within the next couple of years and uh, how to verify the results and what can be said about the hardness of simulating the resulting system with a classical computer. Okay, so uh, you know our um, so so I have recent joint work with uh, Li Ji Chen from Tsinghua University, and uh, what you know we've been thinking about just you know what if you just took you know Martinez's forty or fifty qubits, and all you did was you just applied a random quantum circuit. Okay, so you just did a bunch of random unitary transformations between you know neighboring pairs of qubits in this like uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, lattice or they're arranged on the chip. And, you know, and then you measured the result. Okay, you're gonna see some sample from some wild probability distribution. Okay, so you know, not very interesting in itself. But what can we say about the hardness of sampling from that same distribution with a classical computer? Can we say anything analogous to what we said with boson sampling? Okay, and so you know, we've uh, uh, to some extent been able to do that. Okay, and uh, well, you know, what, what, what we can actually do in this case is just uh, forget about are you sampling from the right distribution or not. We can just say here, you know, is the statistical test that you would apply to the outcome of this experiment, right? <laughs> like, like here's a test that you would do, which involves, you know, calculating the probabilities for the observed outcomes, just like with, with boson sampling, you know, seeing if the experimental results are consistent with, with, with you know, with, uh, uh, with, with what the theory predicts. Um, and, uh, and now we will just directly reason about how hard would it be for a classical imposter to do anything whatsoever that passes that same statistical test, okay, regardless of whether or not they're at, they, would act, they would actually sample from the same distribution or from anything close to it. Okay, so we'll have a purely operational thing we can tell the experimentalists, okay. We can say do this test. And if you see outcomes of your, in your hardware that pass this test, then under a very plausible complexity hypothesis, you know, you are doing something that, you know, that could not have been faked classically in any reasonable amount of time. Okay, uh, so, you know, the verification of the outputs, there are various ways you can do it. Uh, you know, you know that the amplitudes should be like distributed like Gaussian random variables. You can use that to your advantage. Uh, you know, there are theorems about sort of mixing that you, uh, you, can, you can exploit here. Uh, you know, so concretely, uh, uh, you could apply a very, very simple test, like just say take all of the outcomes after you repeat this experiment, say 50 or 100 times, so see 50 or 100 outcomes. You don't need, importantly, you don't need to repeat the experiment an exponential number of times. Right, so you don't need to, characterize the entire probability distribution, you know, which would be way too expensive, okay? You just need to repeat the experiment some small number of times, and then, for example, just check, do at least 60% of the outcomes that you've sampled have a reasonably large probability according to this theoretical <coughs> probability distribution. If they do, then you declare that the test has been passed, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll say, how hard would it be for a classical skeptic to generate any samples, say x1 up to xt, that would pass this same test, okay? And we make a sort of admittedly strong <coughs> hardness assumption, okay? But one that just 
talks about, say, an ordinary decision problem. Basically, what it says is that there should not be any polynomial time classical algorithm that given a random quantum circuit just sort of guesses whether a certain, the probability of some particular outcome is greater than or less than some threshold with, e with a probability which is even like two to the minus n better than random guessing, where n being the number of qubits. Okay, that's admittedly a pretty strong assumption. Okay, um, you know, in, in particular, there is a classical algorithm that will guess the answer with probability like a half plus one over exponential in m, the number of gates in the quantum circuit. Okay, but we'll choose a number of gates which is larger than the number of qubits, like you know, quadratically larger, let's say, right? And so then this is going to be much smaller than that. Okay, so then, you know, and then we don't know how to refute that conjecture. And what we can prove is that if, this can, if you believe this conjecture, you know, if it holds, then it is hard for a classical imposter to do anything that would, you know, that would, that would pass the same statistical test that the, that the quantum device passes. Okay? So, you know, and there's some, you know, a relatively simple reduction to prove that. Okay. Um, so we, you know, we, we, have, we thought about what is the, you know, how would you simulate a, class, a quantum computation classically, right? There are sort of, you know, different ways to do it, like uh, the, Schro the Schrodinger approach would say just store the entire quantum state in memory, you know, and that uses two to the n time and also two to the n memory. Uh, the Feynman approach, if you like, would just calculate each amplitude one by one as a sum of contributions. That uses vastly less memory, only a polynomial amount of memory, but it uses an exponential, you know, it uses a much greater amount of time, exponential in the number of gates rather than just in the number of qubits. Okay, and so you might ask, could you get the best of both worlds? Uh, we observed that you could. Uh, for those of you who know uh, uh, classical uh, computer science, you can do it using an analog of Savage's theorem. Okay, uh, so it's like, uh, um, you know, you can do it using a recursive divide and conquer approach uh, where you could actually uh, uh, simulate a quantum circuit using polynomial amount of memory and um, using a, an amount of time that only grows like the number of gates to the power of the number of qubits, okay? Uh, but that, you know, this still does not falsify that, 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 that hardness conjecture that I made. So the best things that we could figure out how to do you know, um, still, you know, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Is it optimal? Could you improve it further? But if this is the optimal thing, then, you know, then, 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 then this conjecture that I made ought to be true, in which case, you know, the, a random quantum circuit would indeed suffice for a quantum supremacy experiment. Okay, uh, so, you know, there's yet another approach to quantum supremacy, which is called Fourier sampling. Uh, because I'm running out of time, I think I'm going to skip over this. We have some new results about this as well. There's some beautiful work by uh, uh, Bremner, uh, Joza, and Shepard about it. We have a sort of a new kind of way of talking about the computational hardness of uh, a Fourier sampling, uh, which involves some new kind of structural complexity theory. It involves pseudo-random functions. But again, because I'm out of time, I think I'm just going to go to the conclusions. Uh, so. Conclusions are, you know, in the very near future, we might be able to perform, say, random quantum circuit sampling, you know, perhaps also Fourier sampling with 40 or 50 qubits, okay? And, you know, I think a central question is, you know, once we can do this, how do we verify that something classically hard was achieved and that therefore, you know, the extended church Turing thesis was really, you know, if not refuted, then at least strained. Okay, uh, you know, and the problem is, you know, there is no direct physical signature of quantum supremacy, right? Experimentalists keep asking me for that, but there's not one because all that supremacy means is that there is not an efficient classical algorithm to do the same thing. And if you want to talk about the non-existence of an algorithm, you are sort of forced to talk about complexity theory. And, um, you know, I think that as quantum computing theorists, we would be urgently called upon to think about this, uh, even if there were nothing theoretically interesting to say about it, even if it were just merely you know, in, the, you know, in the service of the experiments that are about to be done. Okay, but luckily for us, I think there, there is 
there are theoretically interesting things to say about it. So you know, all the more reason to, uh, to work on this. Um, some of the open problems here, you know, what happens with boson sampling when there's noise and error in your system, in particular when, let's say, a constant fraction, 10% of all your photons get lost and never get detected at all. In recent work with Daniel Brode, we've been able to handle the case where a constant number of photons are lost. Okay, if, if just a few photons are lost, then we can show that, that, that the, uh, the experiment you're doing still retains the computational hardness of the original boson sampling, where nothing is lost. Okay, but if more than, if a constant fraction of photons are lost, which is the more physically realistic thing, then we don't know what happens. Okay, um, so, you know, I would, um, I would love to, to show that, you know, uh, prove that conjecture I mentioned earlier, uh, that, you know, that even a, a, a fast classical algorithm for approximate boson sampling or, or any kind of approximate quantum sampling, for that matter, would collapse the polynomial hierarchy. I've actually offered a $1,000 uh, reward for that, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, ju ju uh, uh, just for you, I will increase it right now to 1,000 pounds, okay? <laughs> but, um, uh, so uh, uh, Li Ji Chen and I very recently were able to prove that any uh, implication like this would need to use what are called non-relativizing techniques. Okay, so it would need to use some interesting complexity theory, but you know, this is no obstruction to its being true. Okay, uh, and then, you know, could there be an efficient, like, uh, classical cryptographic scheme in order to verify that a boson sampler is, do is doing the right thing? So, like, without having to calculate the permanent on your classical computer, could you sort of smuggle into the boson sampling matrix some sort of secret that then when you saw the output, you know, you would know that it was doing the right thing, even though you couldn't calculate the permanent? Uh, Bremner has given a proposal that's sort of like that for Fourier sampling, but we, you know, we don't really know what to say about its security. And in the case of boson sampling, we don't even have a proposal. So these are all things that you know, I, I hope to think about, I hope to get others to think about, and uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>